Good evening. Thank you for joining Art Against Racism's launch of Memorial Monument Movement. We are streaming live from the Arts Council of Princeton on Facebook, YouTube, and artagainstracism.org. Over the last few months, we have gathered art created amid the global movement for racial justice, sparked by the murder of George Floyd. This is precisely the time that artists get to work. The work created has been beautiful, jarringly meaningful, and impactful. Tonight, artists and special guests will show us how their art has been influenced and has influenced this incredible anti-racist movement. I'm Ronald Ponder, and I am the founder of Art Against Racism, a 501c3 organization. The organization is an outgrowth of my work as an artist and activist in the fight for racial justice and against inequity. With my esteemed co-chair artist and curator, Judith Brodsky, hi Judith, and a fabulous organizing committee, we created tonight's project to be a conduit for arts that have inspired anti-racism, voting, and socioeconomic change. We're excited you're here for tonight's journey of artist activism around the nation. Our first guest is renowned mixed media and performance artist Dred Scott. He is here to talk with us a little bit about his project, The Slave Rebellion Reenactment. Here is some of the great talk I shared with Dred via Zoom. Dred, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's start off with the, uh, and take the opportunity, tell us a little bit about your work, what you want us to most know about your work and, and, and you. I'm making art to help people move in a revolutionary direction. I mean, it's, it's art. It's not activism per se, even though I do activism. And, and, but the art, you know, mostly shows in galleries and museums, although some of it shows on street corners. And, you know, I, I think the world needs to be radically changed. Tell us a little bit about the piece that uh, you've uh, granted us the opportunity to show to uh, yeah. everyone. Yeah, um, that's a project called Slave Rebellion Reenactment, which is, uh, was a, a community-engaged performance that happened last year. It was presented in November of 2019. We reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the history of the United States. We had 350 black and indigenous people that marched for two days on the outskirts of New Orleans. We were in period costume from 1811. Um, and we, we were, had machetes and muskets and sickles and sabers, and we marched and chanted, on to New Orleans, freedom or death, we're gonna end slavery, join us. Um, and it was a piece that both was about the past and the, and the present and the future. You know, I think there's actually really something to that. So emotionally, it was, it was heavy. We were, you know, talking about this history, but it was largely like, damn, we're free, we're getting free. It was, I mean, at, by the time we got to the end of the performance, it was the most liberated free space I've ever been in in my whole life. And we created that. You know, we were, we actually got free for a couple of days. Talk to me about the communal involvement in art now yeah. and how that is uh, translating in ter terms of social change and, and the fight for freedom and justice. And you know, it, it, I think the community, when people do work in community engaged ways, it's a way to take substantive important questions and ha have a wider conversation about it as you collaboratively make the work. And, and it is something that, you know, if all forces are contributing in the right way, then it, you make work that is better and that, that could only be made by that process. My brother, thank you very much. I wish you much continued success. You're doing great work. Well, thank you. It was good to meet you. Good to talk with you. So. Thank you so much, Dredd. What an incredible project. I want to take this moment to remind you to vote. Vote, vote early if you can. We created a Promise to Vote portal, which you can access at artagainstracism.org backslash vote to fill out and share how art has inspired your choice to vote. Memorial Monument Movement is so special because art created during social justice movements is often lost to time. Their relevance must live on, which is why we're launching this archive and sharing the work here tonight. It's not too late to submit your own work 
or art against racism projects in your community to this living archive. Please email submissions at artagainstracism.org to get more info on submission details. Our next artist is a sculptor from LA by the name of Dallas Frank. Let's hear so from Dallas. So appreciative that you, that you joined me. So talk to me. Talk to me a little bit about, well, why is it that you are interested in this particular project and, 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 and happy to participate? Yeah, I think, you know, when I heard about the project, I'm like, yes, finally, we are archiving our work. You know, so many of us don't think about that. Don't think about the legacy of what's going on. And sorry, we've got a cat here now. Uh, don't think about the, the legacy of the work that we're doing. So many of it is lost because of that, you know, because we didn't have the foresight to say, hey, we need to make sure that, that um, this uh, is saved for posterity, that um, everybody has an opportunity to be able to, to see the work that's being done. So when I, when I saw this project, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, we need more of this because there are so many more artists out there that aren't being seen um, for the work that they're doing. So this, it, it was just a breath of fresh air to see it. I went on the website. I'm like, oh, this is, the, it looks great. I can't wait to see the exhibition when it comes up because it'll be captured. Uh, what, what people are feeling, how artists are, are showing, you know, their perspective of what's going on in the world around them. So kudos to this, uh, this project. And I hope it is the, the first of many to come. How do you see the role of art, if it has any role, in social change? Oh, well, you know, when I, when I would teach, I used to teach art as well, and I would tell my students that artists don't create in a vacuum. They are inspired and affected by what's going on around them. You know, and I, I talked about Gorneka, you know, and that was created because of the wars that was going on. So our art that's coming out of all of these injustices and inequalities and disparities is, is our way of communicating to people that this is how we see our world right now. There needs to be a change. So, you know, and that's the, that's the role of an artist to interpret what's going on around them, um, how it's affecting them, how they perceive, the artist perceive that it's affecting those that, that are around them, and to be able to give a, a visual and a voice to those people that may not be able to say anything or, or you know, protest or whatever, but they can see this and they can relate to it and they can say, yes, that's, that's how I feel. Art has a huge, huge role in documenting what we are going through, in documenting um, what we wanna see uh, us come out to on the other side um, and, and just highlighting things that are not quite right. I, I think, more of that is happening than we know, which is why I'm really happy about this project because one of the things we want to do is to connect people from coast to coast and internationally and say, look, we're all, there are a lot of us out here fighting and this is a larger community than what the media is portraying it to be. Exactly. Uh, and uh, as, as you're telling this particular story, you're emphasizing narratives of the people. Yes. The stories that we don't hear from anybody else, but we need to hear because this is what life is really like. Exactly. So tell me, are you voting? I have already voted. I've Did already gotten, I have already gotten my message back from LA County saying we have received your vote and it will be counted. And, and I so posted it everywhere. Like I've done my part. So now why is vote, tell us why voting is important. Oh my gosh, voting is so important because um, 
this is where policy happens. If you put a person in office that agrees with your values and you feel they are going to look out for your best interest, you've got to vote. You've got to put that person in office. Even if they're not perfect, it's still better than having somebody that is against you. So voting ensures that you have a voice in how things are going to go for your life. You know, if you don't vote, you don't really have a right to say anything because you didn't participate. We have too many people that have died trying to vote for us to throw that opportunity away. So voting gives us the, the ability to say, we put you in this position and this is what we need you to do for us. So I'm, you can see my, uh, my t-shirt. I've crossed out thoughts and prayers and put policy and change. So that's what voting does. And that's why we have to vote. We'll let you know what's happening with the project. Keep your okay. breath. But thank, thank you really you. very much. This was a wonderful, uh, wonderful session. I enjoyed speaking with you. You are a breath of fresh air. And See thank you hair. again for doing this project. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Sister Dellis, Policy and Change, 5-5. Five, five. Not the area code for Los Angeles, which is where she's from. That was fantastic. Thank you. Now, let's go and take a closer look at our artist submissions for Monument. Hi, I'm Kathleen Hurley Liao, and this is my work, Protest Peace. As an abstract artist, I don't begin my work with any specific plan or intention in mind, other than being authentic in the moment. And as forms began to emerge in this piece, it became apparent that the moment was, and still is, about the Black Lives Matter movement and racism. It's my hope that the work will spur an inner dialogue and that the viewer will ask him or herself some hard questions about history and not only of what's occurring in the present, but has happened in the past. My name is Ryan Lilienthal. I painted this portrait of Maria de la Cruz Perales Sanchez, and the president of Princeton University and the president of Microsoft, as they appeared before oral arguments at the U.S. Supreme Court in support of Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA. This painting is made on top of a collage of the legal brief filed 
by them in support of DACA. The Withering Peach, Georgia Primary Election, June 9th, 2020. This Georgia Peach has a rotten past in laws that set up literacy tests and poll taxes and leaders that planted fear to stop Blacks from voting. In the shade and steps of Lincoln, a young MLK called out, give us the ballot, but it would take years and the scourge of Selma to move a president to enact more security for voting. And then after decades in restraint, the wolves again on the prowl, the Supreme Court lamely claimed, our country has changed. This week, we saw brown and white people roasted for hours on the grill lines, resolved to have their say in voting. The new poll taxes, losing a day's pay to join the fray in line. The new literacy test, how to not screw up a confusing mail-in ballot. A harvest of rotten peaches left behind by wolves. The Art Against the Racism Project reminds us if there is any time to realize how precious life is, it is now. I think art has a powerful role in fighting racism because art has the power to be a weapon of resistance, a way to fight back, and a call to social justice. The skin tones in the word color represent the beauty and diversity of our RISE families, volunteers, and staff. The black represents that black lives matter today, tomorrow, and every day. 
The bright colors of the word love represents the colors that inspire us every day and that love comes in all colors because love is love. May this mural serve as a reminder that we must uplift each and every member of our community until at last, together, we will rise. This is one example of how as a community, we will stand united, celebrate our differences, lift one another, and work together to affect change. When people see this, I want them to feel a sense of belonging. May this mural serve as a symbol that we are all one family. Wow, that was a fantastic glimpse at the power of art. We look forward to showing you more later in the program. Next, we get to hear from another art activist, Congressman Hank Johnson of 4th District of Georgia. He joins us now to talk about how his love of the arts influences his work for social change. Welcome, Congressman. Uh, glad to be with you, uh, Renault. So I know that we're here to talk about the arts and voting, uh, but I realize that you are on the Congressional Arts Committee. Can I am. Can you a little bit about that? Being a congressman offers me the opportunity to support the arts through legislation. Mm -hmm. Some people don't think that artistry is worthy of federal uh, revenue or resources being dedicated to it, but I, along with many of my colleagues, feel like artistry and art uh, are mediums that we need to help our uh, foster because that is part of the culture. Do you, uh, do you have any particular uh, perspective on this, this development of art as a agent of social change? Yeah, I think when, when even if you take uh, a, if you take one of the three percenters or one of the, uh, one of the uh, proud boys, or one of those extreme right-wing groups that are preaching uh, hate or separation, nationalization, that kind of thing, nationalism. Um, even if you take one of their members and pull them aside and give them a, a paintbrush or a pencil and um, ask them to draw or write down their, their feelings, their emotions about what they feel strongly about. Uh, if that person takes you up on that challenge and then expresses themselves, um, then, and displays that for others to view, then that person grows. You're saying that the language of music, language of art yeah, should be a unifier. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. So artistry is um, transcends uh, all boundaries, and it uh, it is a uh, it's a gathering place for people to come together and enjoy something from the heart. Congressman, thank you very much for joining us uh, and talking to us and sharing your words of wisdom. Congressman, it was great speaking with you. We are thrilled to be here broadcasting to you for our initial live stream launch of Art Against Racism. We would like to remind you that we are still collecting art and video of art inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. Please email submissions at artagainstracism.org to get more details on how to submit your work or the Art Against Racism projects in your community. We would like to remind you that we are 501c3 and contributions can be made at artagainstracism.org backslash donate to support this project and our mission. Now we bring you a musical performance from Echizona, a Boston-based rapper with a powerful message. Check this out. I go by the name of Echizona. Courtesy of Comatose Records. This original song is called History Book, produced by Jay Prism. I hope y'all listen real closely. Yeah. We bring up the black gorilla, coming up out the village. Yo, this is not a drill. Have your wives, have your children. We bring up the black gorilla. You got to stop this mission. He just heard for the 
Ten toes down. Thank you. Our next video features Nell Painter, a notable historian and artist, to talk about her art practice and her thoughts on the role of art. Hello, Nell. Thank you for joining us. Nell, would you please share the similarities and differences between your art practice and your scholarly pursuits? Part of the beauty of working in art as opposed to scholarship is that the viewer has a, has a the role. So when I make art, I make art that satisfies my eye and my brain. And um, mostly I give it away. Uh, I have sold several pieces, um, which makes me very happy. Um, but I don't make my art for the market. Uh, I make my art to put in the world. I want people to see it, but the seers, the viewers, play the role that you're asking. What happens to it? Are you voting? Do you vote? And if so, why do you think voting is important? Uh, my husband and I uh, voted uh, Tuesday. As a historian, one of the things I noticed and the difference between the experience, um, the political experience of black communities and the political experience of say, Irish communities was the vote. That because Irish men could vote in the 19th century, um, they could receive patronage jobs. That's the root of the stereotype of the Irish policeman. Um, the Irish cop, that's a, that's a patronage job. Because um, black men were disfranchised, they, they didn't have anything to offer to the polities in which they lived. So they weren't getting um, jobs as policemen or firemen or, or teachers. 
And those jobs paid. And they laid the groundwork for um, economic um, advancement for Irish Americans and then uh, in the fullness of time, Italian Americans and Greek Americans and Polish Americans and so forth. So the vote is the foundation of not only civic power, that is the power to influence policy, but also economic power. What do you think about the recent art movement apparently inspired by BLM? I was just amazed and delighted by the outpouring of, of art around the George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, anti-racist movements of uh, the spring and summer, that people made art, artists made art, but non-artists made art too. And I don't remember an outpouring uh, like this since the Vietnam War and the Black Panthers. And so this art needs to be um, recorded, so because a lot of it is ephemeral and will fall apart. And to the point that it can be collected, it needs to be collected. We absolutely agree with that. And that's exactly why we are doing a uh, memorial monument movement. And, and we really, really appreciate you uh, working with us and um, doing this interview. Thank you for talking with us, Neil. Your work and insight is extremely inspiring. We are now going to show you another set of the fantastic memorial monument movement videos we have created. Let's take a look. I entered the call for participation for art against activism um, because it appealed to me. Um, I wanted to do something to start an ongoing commitment to listen to voices that need to be heard. Um, and figure out a way that I could help with really making our world a better place instead of just leaving it to other people to do. I'm a librarian, so most things relate back to books. Um, in this case, the force of censorship, the use of words and art as tools of propaganda. What came to mind... Uh, was looking through the lens of black culture and white culture, the black and white of print itself, and the explosive power of the written word even long after they're originally written.
Kelly Burke here, artist. I wanted to share my Black Lives Matter flag from 2015, uh, my new black power in all 50 states, the vote him out and vote them out, Christian or immigrant nation, and then most importantly, we the people, SOS, and my reimagined American flag, Black Lives Matter for 2020. It's hard to talk about each one of these and not take so much time. I would just encourage people to look at them and, and consider what messages I'm trying to share and to inspire change and awareness and dialogue and mainly just to express myself because I'm so frustrated I can hardly stand it anymore. I too find it hard to breathe. I'm tired of not feeling like I'm able to breathe as freely as some people in America. The COVID-19 pandemic, the spread of sickness and death, I began to visualize the process of the disease, the physical warning signs of the illness, pink eye. Pink eye with all the social connotations, the stigma, and the evidence of the virus taking hold. I painted each subject likeness, studying their features and what they were telling me behind their eyes. There was so much pain and anger and to the bone fatigue of all the institutionalized racism swimming in their eyes. The series was in direct response to the pandemic in conjunction with the murders of African-American men and women at the hands of police and white vigilantes. The Black Lives Matter Protests across the country bolstered the energy behind my side at Pink Eye series. I was so proud of the hundreds of thousands of people marching against systemic racism and calling for police reform and justice for African Americans murdered through the prism of systemic racism. Schlossberg-Cohen. I'm talking to you from my studio in Baltimore, Maryland. I've been an artist for almost 50 years. In the last 20-some years, I've been blessed with a great crew to do community-based public art. The project that I submitted online was commissioned from Leslie Carver, provost of Thurgood Marshall College, 5,000 students as part of the University of California, San Diego. This was to honor those students because they will be part of the new leaders and visionaries of America. The program that we reflected was their Dimensions of Culture program, which tells the real American history. And this project was to reflect what are the challenges of the past, what can we do in the future to make a difference. Hello, my name is Hetty Bays, and I'm a visual artist. Around 10 years ago, I was invited to participate in an exhibition at Mercer County Community College entitled Dangerous Women. 
Each artist who was invited to participate selected a woman from a list. These women had made contributions to their field, but were frequently under-recognized and sometimes forgotten with the passage of time. I chose Gwendolyn Bennett, African-American poet, writer, journalist, and artist. I chose Gwendolyn Bennett because her poetry deeply affected me. I created a six foot high cube with a doorway. Inside I engraved her poetry into the plastered walls. One had to make an effort to enter into the space to discover what was hidden inside. On the outside, a plain box. Inside, the heartfelt thoughts and emotions and words of a poet. This piece traveled to the International Women Artists Biennale in South Korea in 2009. It wasn't until this current project with Rutgers was announced that I started thinking again of Gwendolyn Bennett. I felt compelled to bring forth and share her words once more that for me are hauntingly beautiful in the hopes that they might reach others as well, move others and open hearts during this turbulent and challenging time. Like the box that I created that one must enter into to discover Gwendolyn Bennett's poetry, it is my hope that her works and words will inspire us all to look within both ourselves and each other, that we might open to each other and discover our common humanity. Facebook folks, we see you out there commenting. Keep the comments coming. Some of the art we have seen on the show has been so inspiring that we wanted to take some time to remind you that in addition to displaying all that great art, our goal is to make sure that we call, that we all get out there and vote. You can send along your promise to vote as well as a message about how Art Against Racism has influenced or reinforced your choice to vote. Fill out the form at artagainstracism.org, vote, backslash vote, and you might see your message and name come up on the screen later in the broadcast. After you fill out the Promise to Vote form, please take some time to look at the rest of our website. We will be adding more work in the coming weeks, and you can find out more about our mission, community of volunteers, and other upcoming events. That is, again, artagainstracism.org. Now our next piece comes from folk singer David Brahinsky, who hails from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Check this out. Only a pawn in their game. Bob Dylan. A bullet from the back of a bush took Medgar Evers' blood. A finger fired the trigger to his name A handle hit out in the dark He hands set the spark to eyes to be Behind the man's brain But it ain't him to blame He's only a pawn In their game A South politician Preaches to the poor white man. You've got more than the blacks don't complain. You're better than them. You've been born with white skin, they explain. And the poor white is name is used in his plain for the politician's gain as he rises to fame. And the poor white remains on the caboose of the train. But it ain't
deputy sheriffs, the soldiers, the governors get paid. And the marshals and cops get the same. But the poor white man's used in the hands of them all like a tool. He's taught in school that the laws are with him to protect his white skin, to keep up his hate. So that he never thinks straight about the shape that he's in. But it ain't him to blame, he's only a pawn in their game. From the poverty shacks, he looks from the cracks to the tracks. And the hoofbeats pound in his brain. And he's told how to walk in a pack, shoot in the back with his fist in a clinch. To hang and to lynch, to hide in the hood, to kill with no pain, like a dog on a chain. He ain't a got no Edgar Evers was buried from the bullet he caught. They lowered him down like a king. But when the shadowy sun sets on the one who fires the gun, you'll see by his grave on a stone that remains carved next to his Really great, David. Thank you for sharing that classic song that has become even more relevant. Our next featured guest is artist Harold Smith, who was the creator and curator of the virtual Black Summer 2020 exhibition of mainly Kansas City-based artists. Here he is to tell us more about the exhibit. Harold, how are you? I'm doing good, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining Art uh, Against Racism. I want to start off with you telling us a little bit about your career and the type of work that you're doing now. My art focuses on the black experience through my lens, particularly as it relates to black men. As a curator, I curated the Black Summer Project in response to the events of the summer of 2020. Uh, I like to tell people that if you want to uh, know what happened, read a book, if you want to know how it affected people, look at the art. And in this particular moment, I see art as an avenue by which the need for change can be expressed. You've done uh, a mural in Kansas City? Yes, there were six Black Lives Matter murals painted around the city all on the same day. And I designed and uh, helped facilitate the painting of the mural at Briar Cliff. Uh, out of all the murals, actually, it was the only one that got vandalized. There are tire tracks all over it. So we came back out like a week later, but we didn't remove the tracks. We painted around them and made them a part of the artwork. And somebody asked me, well, why would you do that? I said, it's like the blues, you know, black people took their pain and their struggle and turned it into an art form. We, we kind of did like the blues musicians. We took what was uh, meant for evil and used it for good. Talk to me a little bit about the significance of community in public art uh, at this time. For example, in the communities, the, the George Floyd and the Breonna Taylor murals and all the other murals show people that these, these victims were more than just news stories or names in a newspaper. It showed that they were people whose lives impacted others. And it also showed how the tragic way in which their lives ended have a cascading effect that will always be felt. Art in the lives of, di of the disenfranchised provides a way to be heard, to be seen. It also exists as a way to record for future generations what happened 
And of course, it can be healing and cathartic by just providing a way for disenfranchised brothers and sisters to let out their feelings. Are you voting? Oh yes, definitely. The fact that voting is, is so important is, is shown by all the efforts to suppress it. You know, it's because of voting in 2008 that we have the Affordable Care Act and a lot of people have insurance that would not have it. You know, when you think about what's happened within this last year, 200,000 dead Americans, probably 80%, their death is somewhat connected to negligence and the failure of government. So by voting, we could possibly save somebody's life or our own life. Thank you, Harold. We absolutely love what you folks are doing in KC. And thank you, thank you, thank you. We wouldn't be here without some key support from organizations. We would like to say thanks to Rutgers University, the Arts Council of Princeton, Spitfire, and Coding for Impact. Thank you again for your support in making this project and tonight's live stream possible. Now you're really in for another treat. They just keep coming. The next spoken word performance comes from creative extraordinaire, Miss G Entertainer. This is me at 12 years old. It's my eighth grade yearbook picture. I was just asked if I could, what would I say to her about her life and growing up and the world today? Half a century after this picture is taken, I'll speak from the perspective of your growing up as a person of color in America, beginning with what you've already experienced. You've been physically and sexually abused, bullied by black kids in school because you're a red bone with good hair, discriminated against by whites because you're black, like when you were 10 years old and they wouldn't serve you, our mom, and our sister. Not in the Deep South, but on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. You're red, white, and black, descended from the true Americans, those that were here, those that came here, and those they brought here. But people only see black when they look at you. When you grow up, you will not allow other people's labels to define you or determine your destiny. The marches in Selma and D.C., the slaying of JFK, RFK, and MLK deeply impacted you. As you grow up, the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement will play in the background, part of the soundtrack of your life. You'll see advances in science that propel technology, medicine, even an international space station. Being the nerd that you are, you'll be thrilled using some of the gadgets that you saw in Star Trek and the Jetsons. There's a thing called the Internet that puts the world and its knowledge at our fingertips so anyone can be heard and buy or sell in a global economy at the click of a button. There'll be slow but sure progress for women, minorities, and all non-straight people who identify as LGBTQ+. There are strides made in relig religious freedom. You'll witness the end of apartheid in South Africa with its first black president, Nelson Mandela, America's first black president, Barack Obama, and his family will occupy the White House. And yet, with all these advances, global warming is killing our planet and its inhabitants. And you know that there are good police officers. After all, our father and uncles were cops. You'll work with and have many friends who are too. But even in the 21st century's officer of the law are still beating and killing black people. Your family, friends, and offspring will still have the talk about going outside black. You'll be sad to see brown immigrant children snatched from their families and made to lie on the ground in cages like rabbit animals, all done at the behest of the current President of the United States. You'll have a phone and a watch that listen and talk to you, but a government that does not. 
This country still hasn't lived up to its claim that all people are created equal, with liberty and justice for all, by a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Basically, if you're not a straight white male, you're still not equal, and you're not one of the people. You'll live through a pandemic and an election that will determine the salvation of our nation's soul. Well, I still have faith. The words of one of your favorite historical figures, Ben Franklin, have now come into play. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. The killing by police of a black man named George Floyd turned up the global consciousness, the collective feeling that enough is enough. When you grow up, instead of adopting a victim mentality, you'll use all that you've experienced to be part of the being and doing change for the better. And change is happening now. Boom, boom, chicky, to pop, pop, a diggy, diggy, boom, boom, chicky, to pop, pop, a diggy, diggy, pow. It's a G thing, baby. Wow. Thanks, Miss G, for that outstanding narrative of black life. Our next activist spotlight comes from esteemed artist and former arts executive Kimberly Camp, who also joined me via Zoom. Let's take a look. Welcome, Kim. Hi, Reinald. Thank you so much for having me today. So what do you believe is the status of public art uh, today? You said the status of public art? Yes, exactly. The status. You know, I, I, now is the time when there is so much exciting news about how people are rethinking public art. And it really is all about refocusing our attention on intention of the artist, intention of the supporter, and most importantly, how pieces will be perceived by audience. In the past, there was probably more emphasis than should have been on addressing one audience instead of another. And right now we're in a time where we're recognizing the power that art has to be a broad influence in society, especially around issues that really matter the most. Tell me what you believe uh, is the connection between art and social change, if any. You know, I, I, so the connection between, uh, or the role I should say that art can play in speaking to a part of society that sometimes is difficult to address is for me a very simple formula if you will people learn by different methods and visual learning actually occupies the majority of the energy that our brain processes every day so as we learn from visual symbols um, images ideas colors shapes lines all of those things help inform how we think that means that public art can, in fact, shift the way that people see the world in which we live. Art is a form of communication. And so when artists take these tools that they have, that either come with paint or wood or stone, and shape these things so that they create in one's mind that ability to rethink how we look at the world, is how we're able to get some of these ideas across in a way that sometimes is very subtle, sometimes not so much. But because it's nonverbal, it appeals to the broadest possible reach of society. And so that's the power that art has in really changing the way um, that people think. I've often told people, especially now when we have such civic unrest, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, inarguably one of the largest protest movement ever in the history of this planet, um, police brutality, racism, the breakdown of our institutions, that when this is all over, and at some point it will be over, people will look to art and artists to remind them of what was important, of what they dreamt about, what their fears were, what their hopes were, what they experienced, how they felt about it, their families. That's the kind of work that artists are doing right now, and it's why it's so important that we document this moment, uh, because it'll help people later to remember why now was so important and remember the lessons of now and why they're so critical to our future. 
Kimberly, you have been working very hard to get people to vote. Why is voting at this particular time so important? Right now, we are seeing the rise of, and, and in many ways, institutionalization of hatred. We can't let that stand. That's not who we are as a country. That's not who we are as a people. And there is no way that this country can continue to thrive, that the economy can regain what it's lost because of the pandemic and because of this current administration. So we do have to vote as if our lives depend on it. Power in this country is the people. President Barack Obama was in Philadelphia yesterday and he said something that I have always told people. A lot of people in this country think that government is something separate, that it's those people, that it's them. Government is us. We're the people. And our government may be as good or as bad as we allow it to be. But the only way we have that choice is if we participate in the franchise and get out the vote. Kimberly, thank you, thank you for sharing your powerful voice with us. Thank you. And uh, I'm so excited about this project. Hopefully it'll get people out, get them get that plan to vote, and get them to the polls on November 3rd. Kimberly, always with the words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Next, we will hear a strong literary message from New Jersey quilter and poet Gail Mitchell. My name is Gail Mitchell, and I'm going to read a poem from my book, Makers and Keepers, for Artists Against Racism. The name of the poem is A.B. Sedarian from a Jersey Girl of Color. An A.B. Sedarian poem follows the alphabet, all 26 letters of the alphabet. Each line begins with the consecutive letter of the alphabet. A.B. Sedarian from a Jersey girl of color. Ancient homeland of my unknown ancestors, Mother Africa. Be they the Igbo who chose to fling themselves off slave ships, conjured up from a deep memory of America's peculiar institution. Or be they dwellers of Dahomey, once a warrior nation of female Amazons, where now Ethnic fawn do the dance of the women warriors at the king's palace. And foreign ships, foreigners ship themselves as tourists to buy applique quilts made by fawn men. Genealogy, especially mine, could be traced back to the baobab tree of life by Henry Louis Gates Jr. along my matrilineal line way back way back, back, way back, to the indigenous tribes descended from the relic bones of hominid, Miss Lucy, just unearthed the birth year of our younger daughter. Kente cloth forever covers my conjugal bed here in the Garden State, living like the Jersey girl I am, 52 years monogamous, where Mississippi goddamn sung by Nina Simone, emits mightily out of Alexa. Nothing cuts deeper than the erasure of kidnapped lives during the Middle Passage. Ordeal made visual by Tom Feelings in his account of the diasporic dispersal. People considered chattel. People scattered like vermin in the Tower of Babel quite entrenched in a horrific history, punctuated emphatically by ongoing racism. Remember the four little Baptist girls. Remember Emmett Till. Remember Trayvon, so many more, and still more, added to this never-ending madness of mayhem. Trying Times, sung by Roberta Flack, hauntingly bemoans vacuous love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We are still here. Very much so. <clears throat> Survivors, 
still pursuing the same dynamic as sojourner truth. Her words of truth, so unlike the xenophobic orality of narcissistic politicians yelling the insidious deep city rantings, rantings of zealots. Thank you for that powerful reading, Gail. Now you will be blessed by the wonderful voice of a 13-year-old star in the making, Sheena Cameron Ash. Listen to this. Hello, my name is Sheena Cameron Ash. I am 13 years old. I'm an eighth grader at Princeton Unified Middle School in Princeton, New Jersey, and I will be singing Lift Every Voice and Sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by thy mind led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet Stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy stand true to our God true to our native land thank you wow 
And she did that a cappella, crazy good. Now we're going to take a look at our third and final installment of the Memorial Monument Movement projects. I want people to feel overwhelmed when they stand in front of this artwork. This is why I chose to make the work seven feet by 14 feet. I want people to think of, the new, of new questions about our racial history and either consult the website that I created, which further explains the laws that I chose, or go learn about the history of the construction of our concept of race and themselves and do that on their own. Finally, I hope the viewers will be moved to further question how we are shaped by political, legal, and societal events that are buried in our past, far from coll our collective consciousness, that still influence our lives in the present moment. I hope that by learning about the roots of these social constructs that we'll find new understandings of the complexities of racism and create a new language to define and resist racism. If I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you, and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money, I didn't allow you to have anything on the board, and then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly, and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa, that was Rosewood, places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property and they burn them to the ground. So that's 450 years. So for 400 rounds of Monopoly, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them. There's a social contract that we all have, that if you steal or if I steal, the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Hello everyone, this is Liberation Artist Ebony H. Flagg show you my newest art piece titled Conflicted. And this piece has a lot of symbolism representing the Black Lives Matter protest and movement. It's my own interpretation of the Norman Rockwell self-portrait. This work grew out of my rage and grief after the murder of George Floyd. I tried to create a floral tribute of the sort that you might see at a funeral. Flowers are standing up to signify survival and strength. The emotions I felt were too forceful to be contained in a plain rectangle. I support Black Lives Matter because it is important for us to make sure that our voices are heard. As artists, we're able to see it in another light and hopefully bring together something positive. Art is really a healing subject.
llego a Puerto voy para Mayarín. De Ando Cero voy para Marcané, llego a Puerto voy para Mayarín. The current zeitgeist in our country and my personal experiences as an elementary school teacher in the Georgia public school system inspired this body of work that I've entitled to an orientation of spirit. My personal orientation of spirit started in 1979 in a small town in South Georgia where I began my teaching career. 40% of my class that year and for the next three decades were African-American children. I witnessed firsthand the impact of racism and generational poverty on the boys and girls who over the course of the school year became my boys and girls. These paintings are the means by which I honor my former students' struggles and strengths and my way of standing beside them in protest. Hi, my name is Hamilton. I am 18 years old. I have autism. This is my aunt. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours. Oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure. Oh, glory. 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 Oh. Let's go. Straight search. 
Can I pat it? Let's go. Let, Let the girl loose. Let the girl stand for the Rock, rock, now, rock, rock, slide, swiss. One, two, three, go left, back, right, back, up, back, down, back, go. Watch out for the big girls. Now bang, 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 rotate for me, rotate for me. Hands up like y'all. Yeah. Yes, we're suffering, and of course, Black Lives Matter. And yes, as a people, we cannot breathe. But I refuse to rehearse I cannot breathe as a punchline because I can breathe. I'll inhale until my exhale becomes a voice, and my voice as fragile yet sharp as a sword, demanding they listen when we speak. I'll suspire for those who no longer can, who weren't afforded the luxury of their humanity. I'll expire until humanity is no longer something someone needs to afford. Coming from sounds of blackness, given this game with no time to practice, born on a blacklist, told I'm below average, a life with no cabbage. That's no money if you're from where I'm from. Did you love that? Let us know. Send in some comments. We would like to again thank all of those that submitted to be part of this project. Now, if your work wasn't shown tonight, you will be able to find it on our website soon. If you are interested in sending in more info or photos of your anti-racist artwork, please email submissions at artagainstracism.org. Next, we are going to experience some poetic insight from David Hirschstrom, who is an independent scholar and president of the Jacob Landau Institute. Couple of questions. Like, just a couple of questions before you go. Night and your absence in our cousined world the same? Fingers of light from our eyes touch those we love? And the last question. How can you masquerade as every day, Carrera marble daylight, 
When one kid of obsidian skin must declare in the street, I am a human, not a target. Come, see, hear, steal. If you come to the end of the street, where windows stare from each side, blank, uncaring as Hollywood shades, where a steel glint from handcuffs ice picks your eye. If you see a pale wrist at rest in a pants pocket, an eye no less bored than the convenience store across the street, a uniformed bent knee, heavy as a fraternal order on a black neck, if you hear, through a storm of imploring crowd, helpless as a stop sign, I can't breathe, can't breathe, can't. Feel your ghost skin peel, steal away into our heart, where that bare black neck slammed to the ground matters or none does. Where on the corner we burn the no exit sign, the dead end. Bone silent. Dawn is not song. Twilight mute. Light, I swear, your name is silence. Bone silent like my own. Justice wakers, truth namers, marching the streets in hundreds of angry cities, mourning a dark man murdered by a uniformed killer with a noonday face. Why can't we hear you, light? How can we choose silence? That was great, David. Thanks for bringing your message to our show. Our next discussion is with Jane Golden, executive director of the fabulous Philadelphia Mural Arts Program. Thank you, Jane, for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. Really glad to be here. One of the things that strikes me about the work that you do, particularly if you're really a city agency, but outside of the foundation, but you're really a city agency that it, that it's really a, seems to be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, a, an activist arm of the city, particularly by the collaborations that you have with the schools and the cultural arts and just every aspect of the city. You, you, you really seem to be a, an, an activist of sorts. Is that a, a correct or incorrect way of looking at it? No, I think that's a very correct way of looking at it. And I think it's a really interesting position to be. Think about it, it's like an insider, outsider, outsider, insider. So in some way we're working within government and some way we're really not in government, but we can take the best of government. So our colleagues who can help us with different issues, um, you know, having uh, a, a bird's eye view into what are the critical issues on the mayor's desk, uh, you know, being able to uh, bring like sort of like certain people in government out to communities like people say i've been calling the streets department for like a year and you're like oh well no problem we can get in we know who and you know so we can be very useful at this how can others particularly municipalities and you again you've been doing this for a while duplicate or even come close to doing what you're doing and and i ask that especially in this time when mural art seems to be gaining a wider appeal uh, nationally. Yes, and that is very true. I think that cities should ask, you know, what are the problems they're grappling with and what role can an artist play in examining these issues or an arts organization? And how do you take the public, the private, the social, the civic, and the aesthetic? That ecosystem has a lot of power and pull it together to work on behalf of the citizens in your city or municipality. And I think the answer, what we're seeing across the country, I'm not just speaking for Philly, is that there's a huge appetite for this today. Because, you know, when it comes to our 
really complicated problems, our traditional interventions are going to fail us. They do. And so our ability to think out of that box and embrace innovation, creativity, artistic ways of being and thinking, I, I think um, it really serves us to do, to do that. How do you feel about what appears to be a rise in the impactfulness of mural arts, particularly in response to the uh, Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. and, and, and in response to the murders of George Floyd and many others, or I'm too glad, many others? I'm glad you asked this question because it's a really important question. And I want to say that I feel honored to be part of the trajectory and history of muralism. And I date contemporary muralism really, for me, I think, to the late 60s and the wall of respect in Chicago. And that the artists had the courage to take to the street and say, you don't want to show our work in galleries and museums? Okay, whatever. We're going to do our work on walls and we're going to represent our lives. And so I see us as being part of this history of public art that, that is a mirror that we hold up to people and say, your life counts, you matter. And this is a way you're invited in to, it's like someone once said that the work in the city is the visualization of democracy. And that just gave me chills. And I'm like, that's right. But it's like, we didn't invent that. We learned that from William Walker. We learned that from artists in San Francisco. We learned it from the Chicano artists working in East LA. That's who we learned this from. Those are our teachers and our mentors. And so I think that it makes total sense that there would be a yearning for art in public space that represents our times. It is the barometer of our times. It is our system of checks and balances. And it is the way that people speak publicly about their lives and say, we, this is who we are and we are not gonna take this anymore. Jane, I feel so blessed to have had the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you oh, thank very you. much. Can we please stay in touch? I find you so, you're so inspiring as well. So I, I would love to. Thank you so much, Jane. Your work of over 35 years has inspired in Philadelphia and beyond. We are thrilled to be here broadcasting to you for our initial live stream launch of Art Against Racism. We would like to remind you that we are still collecting art and video of art inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. So please email submissions at artagainstracism.org to get more details on how to submit your work or the Art Against Racism projects in your community. We'd also like to remind you that we are 501c3 and contributions can be made at artagainstracism.org backslash donate to support this project and our mission. So thank you, everyone who has promised to vote or already voted. You have, as you have heard from many of our presenters, it is extremely important that you vote. Our next and final video is a message you must hear from a politician who is an artist and a major art advocate, poet, and Newark Mayor Ross Baraka. What we want. We want to love ourselves freely. Unfettered images of our grandmothers in our dreams. We want to praise our own God. And we want to see his reflection in our children's eyes. We want to draw him blue like jazz with long dreads and thick lips. We want music every day and especially on Sunday. We want dancing to be a prerequisite for success. We want the blues and jazz and funk, rock, soul, hip hop and RB, and the wealth created from it to be our baby's inheritance. And we want it taught in all elementary schools all over the world. We want to speak for ourselves, we want to represent ourselves, and we don't want no handouts. Yeah, we don't want handouts. We just want everything we created and everything that was created as a result of what we created, and we want it with interest. We need a guaranteed income for all, education like fresh air and food and water and shelter, and be free from sickness and dis-ease. We need long life to collectively oppose death and stagnation. We need ideas and imagination. We should be against hoods like sheeted white ones, the ones that take and keep taking from the meat and often defenseless, even the glorified trap. Yeah, we against the trap too. We need our skies to be free from poison, to 
be able to breathe in sunshine and feel the wind on our faces. We need an end of war and oppression. We need the people to own their own labor. We need every corner of every country developed and every community empowered. We need it all turned right side up. We need the raw materials from the earth used in poverty anywhere exists. We need the calluses on our hands and the pains in our lower back to be added to our savings. Yeah, we need healthcare to be free and information to be free and ideas to be free and the news to be free and learning to be free and the people to be free. Yeah, the people, they gotta be free too. We need inner slavery in all forms and inner exploitation and we need all the money and all the banks in every part of the world to be used for our collective benefit. Yeah, we need all the money and all the banks in every part of the world to be used for our collective benefit. We need to outlaw lies and teach people's history in all languages from the viewpoint of all of us, not just a few of us. We need to outlaw everyone. We need to outlaw everyone. We need to outlaw everyone who opposes the right for all of us to vote, to be represented. No matter where we are, no matter what language we speak, no matter what God we pray to, to dismantle the electoral college. Yeah, we need to dismantle the electoral college and make racism and white supremacy illegal. We need to ban the Confederate flag and label every monument to genocide with a red letter like that book, or just plain tear them down. And replace them with statues of black and brown women that carried us through the darkest moments of history. We need to destroy all nuclear weapons, but first start with automatic rifles. We need to replace the war on drugs with a war on ignorance. We need to destroy the pipeline, the cages, and use the savings to develop the human spirit to treat illness, social, mental, and physical. We need freedom. Not just the Bill of Rights, but rights to build our own lives, to be free from destituteness and hatred and hungry children, free from sickness with cures, under development and cold winter nights with no heat, free from losing our land, our block, our community, our homes, our family, free from choking to death in our own backyard. And schools that undermine our self-esteem, we need to be free from praising those that lynched us. We need to be free from praising those that lynched us and free to pray in any language and to anyone we choose. Free to be free how we define it. We need to be free to be free how we define it and free enough to know that the world is made up of all of us, not just some of us, and that only when all of us are free, none of us will be. And that our collective existence is tied directly to our individual existence, a coexistence with ourselves. Yeah, one big we, one big we, one big giant outrageous we. This is what we want and what we need. This is what we want and what we need, what we want and what we need, and we want it now. We want it now at this very moment, this second. This is what we want and what we need, the now, the now, the now, and the forever, the forever, and the now, the now, and the forever, the forever, and the now, the forever now. We want it, we want it, we want it, what we want and what we need, what we want and what we need, what we need and want and want and need and need and want and want and need like a shower all over our body, like a shower all over our body. We want it. Like the sunshine kissing our faces. Yeah, like the sunshine kissing our faces. After that, <laughs> there is not much left for me to say except thank you to the wonderful team of people who made this production possible. So please read the credits so that you know who they are. And thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Ten toes down, we will get what we want. Be safe, stay healthy, and vote like your life depends on it because it does. Thank you, good night.